Hi, everyone, and welcome to another PRISONS webinar, Adult Living, Residential, and Vocational Options. My name is Allison Stefanok, and I'm a PRISONS board member and an SMS mom. This webinar is brought to you by PRISONS. PRISONS is an acronym for parents and researchers interested in smith mcginnis syndrome. PRISONS is an advocacy, education, and support organization for individuals with SMS, their families, and the professionals who serve them. A recording of this webinar and all past webinars can be found on prisons.org under the education tab. If you have a question for our speaker during the webinar, you can type it into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some time to answer as many questions as we can, but we might not get to all of them. So tonight we will be talking to Daniela Morse, who is the founder and executive director of the Shared Living Collaboration. Share, I'm sorry, Shared Living Collaborative, a unique and innovative human service agency supporting youth and adults with complex challenges in community integrated settings. Daniela will be discussing non-traditional housing options, vocational training, organic farming, employment, social skills through development through animal assisted activities, therapeutic and recreational resources. Um, so welcome, Daniela. I'm Personally, very excited about this topic, as I know many of the members of our community are. Um, my daughter is only 12, but I, we've definitely started thinking about what her future will look like. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us, and I will turn it over to you now. Well, thank you so much for having me. And you know, I'm really excited because I was going to present at a conference and unfortunately had to miss it, but I'm, so I'm very glad that I'm here today. Um, I want to let you know two things you know, up front. One is um, I'm German. I've been here for 35 years. I do have an accent. Um, it's not going to get any less than what it is right now. I have a tendency to talk really fast. If I do talk too fast, please let somebody know and I'll try to slow down. The other one is I want to you know, apologize for my attire. I literally like 25 minutes ago or so just got off my horse and I didn't have time to change. So I'm wearing my horse riding clothes. Um, I hope nobody is offended by that, but it just was one of the things that had happened. So thank you so much for having me. I think that, you know, this is a very, very, you know, important topic and very dear to my heart because over the course of the many years I've been, you know, I've been doing this, um, I get questions from parents, more urgent questions as the years go by and people will say, well, what will happen to my children? When, to my child, what will happen to my child when I die? And it sounds a little bit morbid, but people really worry about it. And, you know, what will happen to our children? And, you know, when you just said that, you know, your daughter's only 12, you already start thinking about it. It is never too early to think about, you know, what are, what are the long-term plans? What is available? How can we ensure that our children um, get the best possible supports for the rest of their lives? So that's what we want to talk about a little bit today. And, you know, I'm aware that people come from different states, different situations, but, you know, principles in general about planning and options and thinking about are pretty, I think, are pretty global. Um, I have talked to people internationally um, who there's, for example, a, um, a gentleman author, his name is Eric Raffi, and he wrote, he went all across the world and talked to different people in Europe and America, in Australia, about what parents are doing for their children, particularly actually for children on the spectrum as they get older. And so it is something that I think is an international kind of a concern almost, it's an international thought. I think I want to prefix this a little bit by saying that we had a very interesting time in human services. I think pretty much regardless of where you live, because the human service system is, I'm sure it is not in a secret that the human service system is very strained and in some places about to implode because we simply don't have the staff and don't have the resources to continue to maintain um, traditional, very staff intensive settings, particularly long term. So I think that whenever there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity. And I think for us to think about long term plans for our kids or for young adults or adults, now is a really great time because the system will not be able to continue to support what, you know, what we have been doing in the past because there's simply not enough resources, particularly not enough staff. So I am glad that you're here. Um, before we get started with like different kinds of different kinds of things, a little bit about our agency. 
So we are a young agency. We were only founded in 2007. Um, I founded it with 12 adults in the playroom above my garage. Um, we have since moved on and we are now a $17 million agency. We have $17 million in revenue. So we've grown very, very quickly. Um, and we have all different kinds of um, programmatic aspects. So we do something that's called shared living. We don't have any group homes, but we match individuals um, with shared living providers, with families, with roommates. Um, we take a lot of things into consideration. We'll talk about a little bit more about that. But we also really um, focus on vocational training. Um, so we have five farms, we have a carpentry workshop, we have a bakery, we have a restaurant, we have a sewing studio. So we have all different kinds of vocational options that in itself then also include things like landscaping. For example, we run a doggy daycare. My dogs are here, hopefully they will not bark um, because we're all allowed to bring our dogs to work because our individuals are taking care of our dogs because we have the doggy daycare and training component. So, you know, we have lots of different options. Um, when people with us residentially and vocationally, we talk about whole life supports because, you know, often people might go to separate day programs and go to somewhere else residentially, um, but we also offer the option of whole life supports. So one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, one of the reasons why we have grown so fast as an agency is that we have focused on people particularly who have very complex challenges. So people who, individuals who usually would be living and working in much higher, in a higher level of care. So meaning there would be, you know, more of an, you know, day habilitation program or more in a behavior kind of oriented program, or they would live in institutions or live in group homes and would not live in the community. And so I think that is, you know, the reason why we've grown so fast, fast is because there's a huge need for kind of alternative options for people, particularly again, people with complex needs like in SMS adults are complex and unique in their needs. So if we think about settings that would you know, accommodate those kind of complexity and uniqueness, we really thinking about person-centered care and person-centered supports. And I'm sure you have heard, I assume you have heard that you know, person-centered support has been one of the focuses of you know, adult welfare in general, that we really provide unique supports. But I think, again, if we think about settings that are nimble and provide those opportunities for individualized supports, there are probably more alternative settings, like, for example, shared living or some adult foster care, or again, some other settings that I'll touch upon, rather than, you know, kind of more residential settings. Because if you have residential settings, six, eight, you know, five, six, seven, eight, however many people may live together, it is much harder to really provide that kind of person-centered kind of care. So the other big question is like, I think all of us as parents, we are looking for creating kind of permanency for our children. We most likely are not looking for our kids to move from placement to placement or from day program to day program. So we really look and what is creating permanency? How, when can we say my child is settled in adult services and I don't have, do not have to worry that much? So when we see in Massachusetts is 22, when kids turn 22, parents say that's really kind of the hardest time for them because they have to let go. They have to kind of turn their children over, if you so will, to kind of an alternative care system. And it's really one of the most challenging things to do. And, you know, interestingly enough, I think sometimes people understand permanency as a building, as like brick and mortar, as like a group home, or we have some parents who build homes for their children and, you know, try to recruit caregivers to live into their homes and figure that might be permanency. But, but permanency, in my experience, really is, is community, is a sense of, you know, an individual, your child, being surrounded by a network of people that, you know, care, a network of people that creates a kind of belonging. And here I want to kind of differentiate between the word inclusion and belonging. Inclusion is something we hear a lot about when it comes to developmental disabilities, you know, are people included? But inclusion really does not, you know, does not entail a self-assessment of the individual included, 
whether or not they actually feel like they belong. So we can have somebody, you know, in a wheelchair be included in an activity, but if we ask them, do you feel like you belong in this activity or belonging to people, many people will say no, because there's a difference between inclusion and belonging. So belonging is a huge, big part. And we, don't, we talk a lot about that throughout because I think belonging and the sense of community is really what's creating permanency and what we are looking for, for everybody. Interestingly enough, you know, belonging in general as, you know, a feeling has really suffered during COVID to the point that there's now actually, actually an institution, an institute for creation, creation of belonging, because, you know, belonging is really a fundamental need for all of us. So when we think about, you know, many times when we start thinking about adult living situations, we're thinking about placement options. What are the options? What is the state giving us? What is in existence? And I actually always find it helpful not to think that way. I find it helpful to say, what is important for my child? What is important for me? What is important for everybody? What are the components that make our life, you know, they make our lives great? And what are the comp components that sets my child up for success? It's another thing that, we, that you hear me say probably repeat a couple of times because if you think about it, when we plan for adult services, we want to set our kids up for success. And there are many, many different pieces that go into it. So when I start thinking with parents about, you know, what their dreams and hopes are, what individuals, their children's dreams and hopes are, I wouldn't think about what's available at the start of saying, what is my vision for my kid, right? Because I think that, you know, otherwise we're shortchanging everybody. So there are a couple of things that are really important in that thought process. One is, I think that every living situation, every working situation, whether it's vocational or whether or not this living situation, has to have a, you know, a fundamental, um, you know, a fundamental, you know, of course, psychological safety, emotional safety, physical safety, you know, it has to be kind of trauma informed because I think so there are like different components. I'm going a little bit all over the place, but you know, there's this, you know, psychological safety thing. People have to feel safe. It has to be a, a trauma informed component in whatever we're doing. And we may not think like our children might have experienced trauma like in the traditional sense. So, you know, have our kids experience abuse or neglect? Many of your children, of course, have not. However, to go through life with SMS or to go to life with autism in itself is traumatizing, in itself. So, you know, anxiety, not knowing, not able to always meet social, you know, social situations, social cues, we talk a lot about that too. Um, sensory, you know, sensory challenges, all these kinds of things can be really traumatizing. So when we look at, you know, at a living situation, we want to look at all those different kinds of aspects. We want to look at things like what I call the biophysiological stuff. You know, does do placement options, do people supporting children look at things like, you know, food, a high quality of food? Do they look at exercise? So when I when we look at creating plans for long-term life, we are really looking at a very holistic approach. And I think in that very holistic approach, you know your children the best. You will be able, and your children know themselves the best, so they also will be able to say what's really important to them. But it's not just as simple as, you know, finding a particular placement and finding a budget that might fit that placement or finding a funding resource. We really have to think about all those aspects. Another really very fundamental aspect of thinking is purpose. So many times, you know, if you think about all of us, if we would wake up tomorrow and we wouldn't have a purpose in life, we would really struggle, right? Because, you know, why, would we, why should we get up? Who would care? Our kids and people with disabilities feel the same way. They have to have a purpose. People are very skilled in differentiating between purpose purposeful things and non-purposeful things of busy work. So a purpose, wherever children are living, working, whatever they're doing is really kind of vital. So um, that's another aspect that I think is very important in looking at, you know, what kind of a living situation or what kind of a working situation would be appropriate. 
The other thing is, you know, again, you know, many times there's a differentiation between the residential options and the vocational options, but vocational options and long-term planning are also really essential. Many times people think that, you know, people with disabilities can, you know, bag groceries, they can work in fast food, they can clean up after people who don't have disabilities. <clears throat> and if you think about that, like if somebody would have come to you in, I don't know, 10th grade and said, you know, the vision for your future is you may, you know, work in fast food or bag groceries. Um, most of us would have not been very happy with that because it would have not reflected our interest. It would have not reflected our sense of pride. Um, you know, again, our, you know, our desire to do something for long term as far as the job is concerned. So even things like that, kind of think about what are vocational options for my kids are, and are they available and what kind of vocation is really important. So we have, you know, created our vocational programs <clears throat> around the premises that we're teaching marketable vocational skills. Um, that are reflective of people's individual interests. So the idea that somebody will go into like a workshop and just, you know, will color, will do classroom work, or will go into the community in itself without any kind of additional purposeful activities, um, I think is shortchanging many folks. I think that our individuals, our children have the same right and should have the same opportunities to engage and pursue careers and vocational training in the interest in the reflective of the interests that they have. So I think that is another really kind of important piece if we're looking at, you know, kind of long term. So what we've seen, for example, what we do is and now, now many farms and we have five farms, we have all the animals we can possibly imagine. We have, you know, chicken and sheep and alpacas and ducks and Many, many, many horses. We have some donkeys. So we teach, for example, um, barn management. And our, you know, our folks who go to kind of barn management training, they will graduate and then they go to commercial barns and competi are competitively employed in commercial barns. People who may, individuals who may struggle with individualized em employment at kind of competitive farms, farms, they have the option to go to group employment with the staff, you know, with two or three other people and doing kind of group employment options. We do the same thing again with restaurant, with bakery, with carpentry studio. So that they're really kind of different options for different people, reflective of their, you know, interest, ability, safety needs. So for example, our landscaping crew, we have a landscaping crew. Um, they have four different kinds of lawnmowers. You have a push mower, a manual push mower. You have a regular gas mower. You have a ride-on tractor, and then you have a commercial lawnmower. So depending on people's safety needs and abilities, they can use all these different kinds of mowers, but still contributing to the general purpose of getting a landscaping job done. So I think, again, there are lots and lots of different options that, that we can pursue if we are kind of, if we are creative. So when we think about alternative, not only vocational options, but also living options, you know, we are doing shared living. I'm a big fan of shared living um, because... Um, and I have to say that there are two different kinds of shared living, you know, in the United States. You have the kind of traditional shared living where you match somebody with a family or with a roommate or with a couple. And then a caseworker comes to visit like once a month and, you know, make sure that everything is all set. That is not our shared living just because the people that we support, um, you know, including individuals at SMS, have often more complex needs. So we actually have a whole kind of, you know, array of services that are typically associated with a higher level of care. So for example, we have nursing, we have an OT, three times a week we have groups. So, you know, people come to us for day program and with us residentially um, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and from three to seven and Sundays, um, from 12 to five, they can choose from various different kinds of what we call recreational activities for therapeutic benefits, such as therapeutic horseback riding or you know, social skills development activity, horsemanship, we go into the community, we go bowling, we go to the gym, we do all different kinds of things. Um, because again, you know, one of the things that's really, really important in whatever we do is to also in our holistic planning, kind of think about what are the social opportunities for people? What happens a lot of times is that when kids turn 
22, their friends stay at school. And all of a sudden, kids are left without a social environment. They may be placed in a group home with people that are much older, or they may be staying at home with not a lot of social opportunities. So the whole kind of social connections is really important. So for example, you know, my children are 33 and 34, and I'm sure they love me, but I'm also sure that they do not want to hang out with me all the time because you know, that would not be very much fun for them. The same goes for our kids. So even when we're planning, we have to think about what will their social life be like? Where will they have friends? Does it have to be an environment where people have to do traditional friendships? Can it be you know, different kinds of social opportunities? Can there access social opportunities that reflect, I call it social stamina, the ability to successfully withstand social interactions for prolonged periods of time. So when I work with people, I always ask myself, what is their social stamina so that I can end any kind of you know, social interactions on a positive note and not exceed what people's social stamina is. So I think, again, that's another really, really important piece is the social kind of piece because all of our children are social beings even children on the spectrum who are supposed to, you know, thought of as not being social, they're absolutely social. They're just social a little bit more um, on the peripheral, a little bit different, right? So, and like to get in and out of social situation rather than being kind of in the social situations all the time. But if I think about long-term, you know, those are, it's a very, very important thing because as we get older, we identify ourselves through the work, social interactions, where we live, what we do, right? So those are the kinds of things in general I think about. Mm. And I think about planning and long-term. I'm asking myself, what kind of a setting would be most appropriate for my child who, for example, has, you know, has sensory integration issues? Sensory, in my opinion, sensory challenges is one of the most underestimated, most powerful kind of um, a challenge or an asset um, that we can work with. It's really interesting because most often people think about sensory stuff when they talk about people with disabilities, right? But all of us have sensory profiles. So if you look at my office that you cannot see that I'm looking at currently, I'm a sensory seeker, very much so. I've got a touch of ADD. My office is like fire engine red. There's stuff all over. And, you know, that really helps me to be productive. One of my coworkers is sitting in an office where and this is weird kind of salmon color and everything is like straight and there's nothing on the walls and the stickies are all lined up. That would be an awful environment for me to work in. I wouldn't be very productive because before long, I would just start moving around and saying, well, where's the action here? So I think again, even sensory profiles, if you think about your child and you ask yourself, could my kid be functioning, happy and most productive in a very busy environment, in a very quiet environment, in a family with five kids and 10 dogs that are barking or where somewhere it's quiet. So all these kinds of things we have to think about in order for people, you know, in order for our, you know, for our children to, in, a, in order to set our children up for success. And that goes into the thinking when we create shared living households. So the way we create shared living households or living situations. So some of our folks, for example, do live independently in their own apartments. We are thinking about all these kinds of aspects, right? What does the apartment look like? Do we put noise canceling materials into, into the apartment? But again, what is the activity level? Um, all these different kinds of things, not only just assessments about what people can or cannot do, but what really makes individuals thrive. We have been experimenting with different kinds of living situations outside of trade living. I want to say a little bit more about trade living. So trade living is basically where we <clears throat> match individuals with shared living providers, but then really there's an extensive circle of support around. Of course, we have on-call teams, for example, for emergency, and we don't have just a notification service, but we have a proactive kind of on-call service that if there's a challenge, people will go out. Um, most often like managers will go out and help diffuse the situation. As I said, we have nursing, we have an OT, we have what we call life coaches because somatics do matter. So just because somebody has a disability or that's a mess doesn't mean their case and they have to be managed. So we call them life coaches because you know life coaches has become something that's you know become much more normal, I think, for all of us. 
So we, you know, life coaches work with individuals. We have the therapeutic activities. We really try to, we have a very kind of eclectic range of therapeutic supports. We do a lot of social skills development, for example, and a lot of trauma work with our miniature horses. Um, you know, and we, you know, just to give examples just of some creative things. So <clears throat> when we talk, for example, about people who have a very high, you know, arousal level, their energy level, very loud, you know, we ask them to approach a miniature horse and they're non-threatening. So even people who've experienced trauma, you know, they have the kind of little horses and they're not threatening. And we say to them, now let's bring your energy level down, right? Because, you know, horses are great because they reflect directly the amount of energy and the mood you're in. So when I went to ride my horse, you know, right before here, I had a kind of tough day, it was like very fast, and I was like revved up. And you know, my horseback riding teacher, who was a wonderful man, said to me after five minutes, just drop, drop down your up, just slow down. Your horse is racing, you're racing, because you know, he picked up on my energy. And so that's a beautiful thing about horses here, reflecting the level of energy we have. We then teach our adults and our foster children as well to kind of slow down. And to kind of just say, let's calm ourselves. And when the horse is calm, we know we are calm. And then we bridge over to, you know, other situations. So when we are in the movie theater and somebody starts to be able to wrap up, we say, remember, remember how you approach the little horse. This is what you want to do. Just an example of a little bit piece of thing. We do a lot of nature stuff because particular, you know, people who've experienced trauma, people on the spectrum, you know, who we also have a lot of, in, uh, we have a lot of young adults who come from a foster care system who then aged into adult services. They do have experienced a lot of trauma and many times it's easy for them to relate to nature and to relate to animals as a foundation and then again bridge it to, you know, to kind of social interactions. We, throughout our systems, we use something that's called social mapping, where we just basically, I love social mapping. I'm a huge big fan of social mapping because it basically teaches social skills um, in a way like a teach math, like one plus one is two. So if you call somebody on a cell phone 150 times, that person will be annoyed. The consequences, they won't talk to you anymore. They will not call you back, which leads to, you know, sad, depressed, and lonely. But if you call only, if you leave a message only once or twice, they call you back and the consequence is great. So we use that throughout in our shared living homes, you know, in our day program, wherever we are because we're finding that particular social skills, reading social cues, understanding the social fabric of interactions is really challenging for many, many people we support. So we have the social mapping techniques that we do a lot with. So again, all this kind of goes into the, the roundabout, the wraparound stuff that goes on here in Trichette Living. We are very heavy into, um, you know, again, the biophysiological stuff. So for example, good food is something that we promote. Eating organic food and eating good food is really a class issue because it's become so expensive. But if you look at particular all the latest research around, you know, the gut brain connection, the vagus nerve, and if you think about how many of you know the people we know with disabilities, but particular people on the spectrum again have digestive issues and also very selective about certain foods, they only eat a very minimum amount of food, and you know, it's really kind of interesting to see how our gut and the biodome really impacts our ability to function. So that is one of the things we look at as well. It's the same kind of, you know, with exercise, we have a lot of people who are very anxious. And, you know, I think one of the things with, again, with people with disabilities is that um, people are quick to prescribe medications. Um, if I would be a little bit depressed or anxious and I would go see my primary care physician and say, hey, feeling a little anxious lately, um, my primary care physician will probably be very unlikely to prescribe me some heavy duty medication. Um, but people with disabilities is often different. Um, they do prescribe medications much quicker rather than saying, you know what, you know, I would recommend that you go and exercise three times a week for 45 minutes or 30 minutes, aerobically, whatever you want to do, um, and that will help. So we, we're looking again, there's a holistic aspect of really kind of looking at the fundamentals to again, set people up for success. When it comes, you know, so that's a little bit about shared living. That shared living, again, our shared living is a little bit untraditional, but it reflects all the different kinds of components that we think contributes to people being successful and also then building a community 
around people. And I'll talk a little bit more of that in a second. But we've been experimenting with different kinds of living situations. And you know, people usually associate experimenting in social services as something that, you know, that shouldn't happen. But as long as it's done in a really thoughtful and safe way, there's nothing wrong with trying certain things to meet needs of individualized people. So for example, we have um, we have a apartment complex in Hebel that we went from a wonderful man. Um, he's wonderful because he is renting apartments to us at cost. And I don't know about where you are, but in Massachusetts, the events are absolutely crazy. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find a studio, a one bedroom apartment for $1,800, which of course exceeds what many people with disabilities can pay. So we have established relationships with landlords who are willing to rent to us really below market value because they believe in what we're doing. So we have this apartment complex and you know, we have a couple of staff living there. We have a son of one of our life coaches living in there with his family. And then we have four individuals living in the same apartment complex um, who could almost live independently, but not quite. Um, so it's been a very, very kind of successful situation because they have their own apartments. Um, three of them are actually on the spectrum. And so the, you know, the landlord has built out the apartments based on their needs. Again, very simple, you know, noise canceling materials, carpets, light dimmers, all these different kinds of things that are really helpful in order for people to thrive. In addition to that, there's a common room that was originally a garage where people can go and socialize if they like to, but they don't have to. So they don't have to have people come into their own apartments, which is a little bit hard for some of our folks, but they can go out and they kind of socialize. And in that social room, you have different zones. So you have kind of one is close to the wall, looking out the window with a couple of computers. That's people who, you know, social stamina is not that great. And then you have, you know, options all the way to kind of really, you know, like a table with different kinds of games so people can interact. So that has been a very, very kind of successful model because somebody is there all the time. There's assistance. There's somebody there in case of emergency. People do have the independence, but again, get support. And again, they also get case management, all those things like that. But what, that was one of the situations that, you know, has been a wonderful model that we're seeking to duplicate for others as well, which is kind of a little bit of a hybrid between shared living and independent living. The other thing that we're very excited about is we are actually starting our first tiny house community. So again, in our quest to find, you know, living situations that, options because it's really about variety of options we um we have found that many of the individuals and families who come to us really feel very comfortable on farms so they say we don't want to only work or the individuals don't only want to work on a farm they also want to live on a farm because they like the nature they like the animals so we are starting our first tiny house community actually we are building and it's you know, hopefully gonna be done um, in October, where we have four tiny houses. One of them, you know, a staff is living in, in the tiny house and the other three are going to our individuals who also happen to work on the farm. So they basically have their own homes, but it's kind of a similar principle that somebody is right there. It's just a different kind of a situation, um, you know, as far as living situations. So I think it is really important that we think about you know, creative ways. And if you also look at each of these two examples that I gave that a little bit different, the house, <clears throat> the Heva house that we are that we're renting has that sense of community and belonging. <clears throat> the residents in the home independently, like for example, um, in a couple of times a week, there's a cookout. So people, everybody will come out and join the cookout. They don't have to, but it's an option. So there's a sense of community and there's a sense of belonging to that community to that house. <laughs> the tiny house community is the same thing. There's a common purpose um, of taking care of animals, taking care of the land, and there's a sense of belonging. So that is kind of, you know, the way how we are looking at, you know, creating communities. Sometimes people ask me, for example, in shared living, if we place somebody to share living, you know, placements always succeed. And the answer is, no, not always. The vast majority of people certainly do. Um, the vast majority of shared living placements, 
because we are also very committed to, you know, complement shared living providers, also to complement our staff in general. But for example, we may have a shared living provider who is absolutely wonderful with behaviors, but is really a lousy housekeeper. Um, then we get them a housekeeping service because, you know, it's really important for us that, you know, that we have providers who are great with behaviors and that complements because none of us is good at, at anything and everything. I also have to tell you that, you know, our entire agency culture, and that's, I think it's another big piece, and I'm dumping again because I look at the clock, but I think what we've tried is to develop an agency culture that is committed to <clears throat> positive, non-adverse, non-adverse, real life options. We look at ourselves as option brokers with an entire agency culture being focused on committing, being focused on ongoing learning, being focused on ownership. Um, so for example, one of the things that we have is we have almost no staff turnover, which is rare these days and we work very hard for it, but it's part of our agency culture because again, you know, staff turnover is very, very hard on the people we support. So we wanna have a, a culture where people are committed because if our staff, if we as an agency cannot commit to our staff or our shared living providers, they cannot commit to the people we support. So an agency culture is really, really important um, in order to build that kind of community. But back to like the shared living always working out. Shared living sometimes is not working out for many different reasons. You know, for example, um, some people, you know, just age. So I've personally been a shared living provider. My husband and I, my kids, my kids actually grew up and, you know, um, uh, the woman who's been living with us has been living with us for 25 and a half years. Um, and, you know, she's getting older and she's in the wheelchair, she's lifting. So I'm not sure, you know, how long my trick and my husband, because he's a primary caretaker, may be able to support her um, the way that we're doing. So those are the situations where, you know, sometimes we face challenges, but there's always somebody from within the community who knows, another staff, another provider, somebody, a neighbor, somebody who says, you know, if something doesn't work out, I'll take care of this person, I help you, or I know somebody who can help you. And that is kind of the creation of community that will lead to permanency. So it's really kind of that holistic look and at what makes our kids happy, successful, sets them up for success, and non diverse non-averse positive focus. So for example, we are a strain-free agency. Um, we, you know, many, many people who are coming to us have a history of, you know, long-term institutionalization, psychiatric hospitalizations, and certainly restraints, school systems, wherever they were, we don't restrain people. Um, so, you know, we really find it disempowering and, you know, not helpful and traumatic for people to be restrained. Obviously, if somebody would walk into the street or run into the street, we would prevent them from doing that. But as a behavior intervention, we don't do these things. As a behavior intervention, we also do not do any kind of formal behaviorism stuff. So we do not do ABA, we do not do PBS. Um, we have elements, but we don't do it because we also find it wrong, quite frankly, to reduce children and adults with disabilities to the sum of their behaviors. Um, so if I would look at my husband, you know, I could probably come up with a behavior management plan for him or, you know, a reward structure, um, but that's not how we look at each other. Um, and that's not how we should look at people with disabilities. You know, people with disabilities are complex and they deserve to have the same kind of role of supports and learning and therapeutic opportunities like everybody else does. Another big focus we have on just again back to the holistic stuff, right? It's you know, just setting kids up for success or young adults is really communication. You know, how do our kids communicate? Do they live in an environment where they're being heard, where they are able to communicate? Because that's a huge big thing, right? It's communication piece. So all that stuff goes into kind of thinking about different, you know, different approaches. Another thing, let's go back to the housing a little bit, is another option that we have that we like a lot are in-law apartments. So, you know, in addition to kind of more traditional models in shared living, so we have several homes with in-law in apartments. Again, 
where somebody can open the door, they're part of the household, somebody can close the door and they kind of have their own apartment, if you so will. Um, so again, there are all these kinds of options that then allow, you know, for a good matching of somebody with a particular housing or, or vocational option that we have. So many times, you know, people come to me and say, well, Danielle, did you think this all up, right? Did you like, at one point when you were in the playground about your garage, did you just have this vision? Like, this is what you want to do, one, two, three. And the answer to that is absolutely not. I'm not smart enough for that. But what we are doing and what we continue to do is we are getting feedback from parents, our individuals, of course, the state, staff, and we continue to evolve and we continue to together look at, you know, diversifying options we have for living in vocational situations. We're looking at, you know, at creating new situations. We're looking at doing things differently. And it's a constant kind of quest that I think is also very much driven by parents because really you are the ones who are saying, I want something different for my kid. And that's one of the things that's interesting that I have heard more than I've ever heard before, that people, you know, parents and children want something different. They want something more. They want something more fulfilling. They want something more individualized. They want something more meaningful. And I think it is really our obligation to research that, to create that, and to build it together. Um, so that's kind of my... Yeah, that's kind of my introduction to shared living because I know it's now quarter of eight my time. Am I still good? You are still good. Um, you can talk as long as you want. Uh, I know that you have a second webinar planned for us and that's going to be a really big treat for us. But absolutely, if you have more to share, um, we're, we're not really constrained by time. So feel free to <clears throat> add some more, wrap up, whatever you want to do. Yeah, so that was a kind of introductory piece. I think we're probably going to take questions because then I would have to start another whole section and I don't know if I would be able to fit that into the next five minutes. But whatever, if there's any an interest about a particular topic, but if I would start this next section now, that would go for, for quite a while. Absolutely. Um, and we do have questions, a question and answer, so we can we can cover lots of stuff there. And um, and thank you. And I'm really looking forward to to part two of your of your webinar. So um, part two, you know, I think what I'd like to do is so today again, I was explaining I'm a little bit of short on time. In part two, I will give you all the slides and all the handouts, but I also will you know share some pictures with you so that you get a little bit of an idea what different situations may look like because it's kind of hard sometimes to anticipate, you know, to visualize. Perfect. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I mean, your work is absolutely inspiring. Your philosophy is beautiful. And I really appreciate, I know that this information is going to be really beneficial, beneficial to all of our parents. Um, so thank you. And we do have some time for the for question and answer. Um, but before we get into that, I do have a short video to share with you. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Karen and Joshua Dixon. Um, they've put together a great little video for us about prisons and how it's impacted their journey with SMS. Sure. Hi. And this is Joshua Dixon. We're really grateful to PRISMS. Um, Josh was 16 years old when we got a diagnosis of Smith Progenis Syndrome, and it was really because of PRISMS. We happened to meet a support group from Texas that was meeting at a special needs theme park, and they recognized Joshua straight away. Through them, we were not only able to get a diagnosis, but we've got so much more information. We haven't really found any providers that know anything about smith Magenta syndrome. So having PRISMS as a resource has been wonderful for us. We really appreciate everything that the organization does. Josh, what do you think of PRISMS? Well, I mean, honestly, because it helped me be a lot more open and public. I don't worry about uh, all the stuff that I, I 
كده كده يشتري مين يقول ايه I mean, I have a lot of fun that I know that that's uh, really make sure that it's concrete and it's like we've been struggling for years to have a life. So there was ADD, which I still have and all that, but it was been definitive. So basically, thanks, Prisms. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Karen and Joshua, for putting that together for us um, and sharing your story. That was really great, especially to hear from Joshua um, directly. That was fantastic. So now we have some time for question and answers. And um, we have a lot of questions tonight, so we might not get to all of them, um, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, all right, so let's get started. So the first question, um, this is an easy one. What is the name of your agency? We call Shared Living Collaborative. And you are more than welcome to come by and visit us at any time. We love visitors. Um, so if anybody would like to come and visit, please come by. Great. Um, okay, uh, next question is, where are the locations of the Shared Living Collaborative models? So we are only in Massachusetts and we are you know, primarily north of Boston. We have a few homes in central Massachusetts. We have some in Southern Mass, but we, it's primarily in Massachusetts. We have, we however are willing to share. So we have gotten, you know, so many inquiries, particularly after the article came out on the Rolling Stone magazine about us, like in 2016, I have to tell you, we grew so fast, we don't even have a website. So, you know, the, the biggest kind of press, you know, release that we have or the press article we have was in the Rolling Stone magazine that came out in 2016. And we got a lot and lots and lots of requests for, you know, can we do something like this where we live? Can you help us start something? Can we take some ideas? Can we have your paperwork? And the answer to that is absolutely. So, you know, even if you're not close to Massachusetts and if you're interested in finding out more about a particular model or, you know, about shared living in general, or if you like to duplicate something, or if you want to start your own program, or if you want to start your own tiny house community, we are happy to share anything and everything that we have. So any, any materials, any, anything you would need. That is absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you, thank you for that. And um, okay, so the next question has a few different parts, um, but very important to SMS. So um, are there individuals that have needs beyond what you can provide? And what are the parameters of your services? And are you able to handle individuals who engage in self-abusive behaviors or aggression towards others? So yes. So we are, there are very rare occasions where we cannot handle, you know, somebody who we, well, because again, so when, when we take someone in our agency, we really try to get to know them before they come so that they, we can really make a commitment. You know, so there's, there's a transition process consisting of visits and, you know, just kind of gathering information and meeting with parents and meeting with, you know, collaterals, whoever wants to meet with us. So that by the time we make a decision and saying, yes, we can support that person, um, we are reasonably sure we can. There's sometimes, does it always work out? Not always, but the vast of the majority of the time it does. We do take people with aggressive behaviors and we do take people with self-injurious behaviors, but we are, we are approaching things a bit different from traditional kind of models. So for example, if you know, somebody engages in aggressive behaviors because they're anxious, because many, again, most of the time when people you know, engage in behaviors, there's a good reason for it. And very, very often it's anxiety, it's overload, it's all different kinds of things. So we really try to find out you know, why people engage into those kinds of behaviors and then what we can do to prevent them. So it is more of a proactive focus rather than giving somebody a consequence and then expecting that they would learn, um, that's not necessarily the case, right? Because I think a lot of times when we look at, you know, child welfare or social services, we think that, you know, people would just, if you give them the consequences, they will say, aha, uh -huh, you know, now I know how to do that. That's, that's way too simple, right? Because otherwise all of us would have gotten up this morning and had a bowl of special K and went running for five miles because we know that's the right thing to do, right? So we really look at the complexity of things. Um, so, and that's where the person-centered care comes in. So for example, many of the 
of several of the people we have with fragile X, when they get really anxious, they go on themselves. They go on the floor just because they're anxious, right? Under normal circumstances, you would say, we need to get up, we need to get going, we have to go and get the van, we have to do this. We don't do that, we wait. We wait. We wait. If it's four hours, if it's five hours, we wait until they're ready to come up and they're ready to, you know, to move on their own account. If somebody engages in, you know, we have people who have a history of throwing computer screens at us or printers, which is not necessarily pleasant. So we then try to sometimes exchange lethal items for non-lethal items. So we may give them like a board of, you know, paper, a couple of box of paper and have them rip it up, you know, just in replacing things. So there are lots of individualized ways how we handle it, but we just look at aggressive and self-injurious behaviors, not as aggressive or self-injurious behaviors, but as misunderstood ways to communicate that something is wrong. And I think that is the piece because behaviors are really just another way of communicating. And that's why I think language a lot of times and meaning attached to language, because some people know the words, but not the meaning necessarily, is a really important piece of what we're doing. But we are just looking at behaviors as communication, if that makes sense. It does. I love that. And that's so true. That, that really is. Behaviors clearly are just another form of communication. Um, so that's wonderful. Okay. The other pieces to that with the behaviors, because it's one of my favorite topics, I'm probably going to talk a lot about next time, because that was a section I said, should I get into? Behaviors is my favorite, favorite topic. The, the other thing about behaviors is just like, why do we put people in a position that they have to behave that way, right? Because that's the other thing, you know, because having a temper tantrum and being out of control is very uncomfortable. And so how, you know, why do we put people in that position? So the first thing when somebody is having an issue, I'm asking myself is what have we missed? What are we missing? Why do we have, what, what are we missing, right? It's another, it's a non-punitive saying we did something wrong because otherwise, right? does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, it does. Um, okay, I think, so we, we have a couple more questions that I think we'll have time for. Um, let's move on to this one. So this uh, is, thank you so much for emphasizing community and sense of belonging. Um, uh, I know the answer to this one, what's your organization's website? I think you mentioned that you guys don't have one yet. But you know, it's, been like a, it's been a running joke because, you know, we, we grew so quickly mm -hmm. that we, we couldn't sustain, you know, any more traffic. I mean, still to this day, we can hire somebody to give tours full time, which we, you know, again, we love visitors, we love tours. But I think we are, for the first time, working on a website because our challenge was always just like, what do we want to market? We don't have to market more people coming to share living onto our day programs because, you know, they're pretty, it's a downfall of human service agencies to grow too large. So growth is not something that we are definitely tied on our agenda, but we want to market the concept. So we actually are working for the first time on a website that is just marketing a different approach to people and a different approach of providing services. Great. Um, okay, and then uh, this has a few more parts. So do you provide services outside of Massachusetts and such as consultations, et cetera? And are you aware of simil similarly minded organizations in other US states and regions? So we are providing consultations, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, we are particularly committed to parents who want to start something, you know, but we, in general, we're providing consultation, but um, we also have a pro bono piece, you know, parents would come together and say, we have three or four parents, we want to start this, can you help us? Absolutely, we'll do that, you know, we, we, because we love it. There are really not that many, I'm not aware of anybody who's like-minded than us. We have bits and pieces. You have farms, you have therapeutic horseback riding. I don't know if you're familiar with Camp Hill. Camp Hill is kind of an international movement that, you know, is people working on farms. They're, you know, they, they grow, they grow, you know, food. Um, they're, you know, they have a very similar philosophy to ours. The, the, the difference is that they don't take, they don't support people who are really challenging. So, but the philosophy is similar for people who are, you know, not challenging, but we really are, there's really nobody like us out there. Okay. Um, 
Well, that is unfortunate. I hope that there are many, many places that um, that will be like yours, um, because I know that we all are looking at this thinking. I, I know I'm looking at it thinking, oh my gosh, I really want my daughter to be here. So um, it sounds incredible. Uh, so thank you so much. And thank you, I mean, being willing to share all of your information and philosophies and help parents get started. Um, if that's what they want to do, that's just, that's wonderful. So helpful. Um, so we really appreciate you and um, and all the work that you do. And I so I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. And let's see here. Um, one moment. I um, I want to thank everyone um, for being in the audience today and um, for all the great great questions that we had. Um, I hope to see everyone on future prisons webinars. Um, so please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Um, of course, join PRISMS if you're not already a member. Membership is free, and it's the best way to stay up to date with all things SMS. Um, PRISMS is a nonprofit organization. All of our programs, including this webinar series, are fully funded by our donors. And a very generous donor is offering a match up to $100,000 to inspire other donors to invest in prison's work. So we are, of course, extremely excited and grateful for this opportunity. And this is an excellent time for you to support prisons and the many programs that it provides to the SMS community, like our webinar series, our conferences, peer-to-peer -peer support, SMS clinics, the patient registry, and much more. So we invite you to use this QR code or the link and take advantage of this incredible opportunity to double your donation. So this concludes our webinar. I hope that um, everyone has a great evening and thank you so much, Daniela. I really enjoyed every minute of your presentation and I am very much looking forward to the next presentation that you give. Thank you so much for having me. Good night, everyone. Good night.